Okay, good afternoon. It's lovely to see a room full of budding students. Very, very warm welcome from the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development to the student lecture that at which we have the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development as our guest speaker. On that note, I'd like us to all, just for record purposes, my name is Asya Khan. I am directing your program for today. I am the Director Legal at the Department of Justice in KZN. And I, we are your hosts for today. Uh, I'd like us all to rise for the national anthem. Thank you. We definitely have one of the most beautiful anthems in the world. As I've said to you, can we, okay, let's proceed with our program. I'm Asya Khan, Director Legal, KZN Department of Justice. A very warm welcome to the Department of Justice Deputy Minister, Mr. Don Jeffrey. Delegates from the KwaZulu-Natal Commission for Gender Equality, the Chairperson of the Legal Practice Council, the Deputy Chairperson of Cultural, Religious and Linguistic uh, Communities, uh, members of the various tertiary institutions and all you students. This student lecture is part of the Nelson Mandela Month commemorations for which the global theme for this year's celebrations is do what you can with what you have wherever you are. The Department of Justice and Constitutional Development as the custodian of the Constitution of South Africa, which is the pillar of our democracy, has a fundamental role in educating South Africans about the strides and contributions made by our freedom fighters and our struggle icons, especially Nelson Mandela to realize the freedom and democracy that we are all currently enjoying. This lecture will also provide a platform to continue to celebrate and mark an important milestone in the history of South Africa, the 25th year anniversary of the Constitution. The Constitution came into effect on the 4th of February, 1997. Therefore, our progressive Constitution has been applied and has guided our democracy democratic government in the past 25 years. The theme for this lecture is promoting the culture of human rights, Nelson Mandela as the advocate for human rights. The ministerial lecture aims to inspire young people like yourself to sustain the legacy of Nelson Mandela by respecting and promoting the culture of human rights 
and by upholding our constitution. It also seeks to encourage you to forge resilience and to pursue opportunities for a sustainable livelihood, to inspire you to take action to help change our country for the better, as well as to strengthen partnerships between government and tertiary institutions from which you all come. We look forward to hearing the Deputy Minister and the inputs from our various role play, uh, players. We trust that we shall engage in fruitful discussions this afternoon. So now that you know why we are here, let's roll with the program. I'd first like to welcome uh, some, the university representative who will be doing some welcoming remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all the students that have uh, made it possible for us to be gathered here today. <clears throat> I am Advocate Bahle Sogoni, uh, the director at the law clinic at the University of Zululand. Um, we are so delighted that today the minister has uh, visited us. Uh, we are a university that is uh, based in the deep rural of KwaZulu-Natal and is situated in a sea of poverty. Uh, Minister, I had discussions with my students uh, in preparation towards this day and my student conveyed messages of gratitude for because your department has made it possible for us to be here in terms of paying for all the expenses including catering. We know that uh, as the University of, um, of Zululand, we sometimes call ourselves um, the stepchild of the system because we are in the rural area. So if anybody wants to visit, they come to Deben, you know, where there is uh, street lights and uh, the fast life. Um, the message, we've got two, two messages from uh, my students, uh, one of the minister. We are finally uh, law students and very progressive students. Uh, Ms. Khan will, will um, testify to this that uh, where she works, the chief magistrate is an alumni of uh, and uh, there is quite a lot of alumina from the uh, University of Zululand, but unfortunately we don't uh, blow our own trumpets. There are two, two issues that I want to cover with the minister. Minister, like I said, we are the stepchild of the system. It is because of all the institutions, nine institutions in Africa, they all have what is called PLT is professional legal training, which is compulsory for all students to have. But it does not happen in the uh, of Zululand. And we have tried our best, we've spoken to everyone, and everybody wants to help us. Today, the message that I've got for the minister is that, please, minister, can you use your word of mouth and make sure that by next year we have PLT at the University of Zululand. And the easiest way will be <coughs> to talk to University of KwaZulu Natal because they have PLT at the at this um, Howard College. They've got another one at um, Peter Marisbeck campus, and we have nothing. All we are asking for now is that they have a satellite in the University of Zululand. Just for me to help you, because you see this student that are, are on my left, 
there's 40 of them, there's about 113 of them. I am sure that next year, because they can't afford rentals in Devon, they will be sitting at home doing nothing. And yet, it is compulsory for them as law students to do PLT. It will not be done unless the minister speaks. I, I have confidence in your office, minister, in the, in the persons of Ms. Mosi, Ms. Tlangulela, Ms. Desibia, that if I talk to those people, something will be done, definitely. Uh, and also, minister, we also want that um, our students be placed in various departments of this administration including your department, the department of um, DECO. Uh, I would so wish that uh, the, the ambassador to Ethiopia, who is my schoolmate, can heed my call because I've asked him several times to have just one student in his office who will make sure that uh, at least one firm from Ethiopia is uh, built in his hometown in Mount Frey. And uh, if that could happen, a lot of uh, developments will be achieved because in, at the University of Zululand, we, we make sure that uh, our students shine wherever they are. Minister, we hope that uh, this day is going to be fruitful for everyone, for all the students that come from other institutions like Mangosutu, Technicon, Coastal College, Howard College, Elangeni, Tivet College, and uh, I also want to acknowledge that we have amongst our myth, Mr. Mangova Mkunu, who is um, a, 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 a journalist from the Highway Radio. I hope they will also um, pass the word to say today we ask the minister and we show that the minister is going to heed our call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Advocate Sugoni. Uh, Minister, Deputy Minister has taken heed of what you've uh, asked for. And at this stage, I want to welcome all our students from the various universities. University of KwaZulu-Natal, you are here. University Mangasutu, University of Technology. Durban University of Technology. Coastal FET College. Howard FET College, Ilangeni FET College. You are all welcome. I'd also like to welcome all our other stakeholders who have taken the time out to join us, your participation and your acceptance of our invitation is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, to go on to the program, we've got some very dynamic speakers who are going to talk to you from various uh, organizations, chapter nine institutions, just so that you have a better of understanding. Department of Justice, we don't stand on our own. We manage to achieve our goals through our various partnerships. So I'd like to firstly introduce Ms. Zanele Ntuane. She holds a social science degree she is the provincial manager for the Commission of Gender Equality, who plays a very pivotal role in the administration of justice. She's, uh, she has acquired extensive experience by working for non-government organizations, and she focuses on social justice for vulnerable and marginalized communities, and who better to talk to us from the Commission for Gender Equality, Ms. Ngwane herself. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Program Director, Deputy Minister, Honorable John Jeffrey, um, members of the Chapter 9 institutions, greetings to the leadership of the Legal uh, Practice Council, leadership uh, from the institutions of higher learning, and a special greetings to, to um, all students that are present here today. As it's been said, my name is Zanele Nwane. I am from the Commission for Gender Equality. Um, 
I would like to start by uh, opening with a quote uh, from the former president, uh, Nelson Mandela, which is taken from his uh, first speech as the democratically elected president in 1994. He said, I quote, Freedom cannot be achieved unless women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. Our endeavors must be about the liberation of the women, the emancipation of men, and the liberty of the child." End quote. Four key points on the above quotes, which are important for me as a person that is working for the Commission for Gender Equality. It's one, it's the matter of the women um, and oppression, it's the liberation of women, is the emancipation of men and the liberty of uh, the child. All the four encompasses the mandate of the CGE. Our mandate of the CGE is, the CGE is to promote, respect, the protection, development, and the attainment of gender equality. That is the core mandate of the CGE, and that is empowered by the act of the Constitution. You will find the establishment and development of the, uh, of the CGE in the Constitution of South Africa, under section, under chapter nine, subsection 187. I have heard that he, here we are speaking to lawyers, so I know lawyers, they always want to have reference. Um, what gives you powers to even stand and speak here? So we further derive our powers from the CGE Act of number 49 of 1996 as amended. As you heard in the introduction, I'm not a lawyer, I'm actually a social scientist. So I've been cautioned all the time that I must always make sure that I end, I add the as amended. So I must always be correct and, and add that as amended. In my um, social science understanding, for me that was not that important. It's important that we have the powers. So the vision of the CGE is that of a society free from oppression and from all forms of inequalities. That is the vision of this Commission for Gender Equality, a society free from gender oppression and all forms of inequalities. Unfortunately, women worldwide continue to live under a lot of uh, inequalities. We live in a society that uh, provides women unequal opportunities to succeed. In many parts of the world, women are less valued than men. At times, their rights are violated, leaving them with little uh, uh, recourse. We are here, we are lawyers, we are the ones that are supposed to provide recourse when people are faced with injustices. In some countries, which include South Africa, there's a huge pay gap of salaries and wages between men and women, even though they are doing the same job. But on the positive side, we see there's a lot of um, progress in the participation of women in, in the economy and then increase in the um, uh, role of women in the leadership positions. So there are some pockets of, of successes, but those pockets of successes are so min minor and minute that what we still see is a lot of injustices. And that is why we are here today wanting to discuss those kind of uh, justices. And for us to address those injustices, we believe in, co in collaboration with stakeholders, both within and outside the country, the South African public at large, government institutions like we are invited today uh, by Department of Justice, political parties, it's very important that we also collaborate with them, civil society uh, organization, and fellow, nine, fellow chapter nine institutions. It is important that we also partner with uh, institutions of higher learning. We've seen a lot of co co collaboration bearing fruits in what is called the National Gender Machinery, where we have been able to uh, see and nourish growth and strengthen the work of the CGE. Um, I won't shy away to say that as the CGE, we are such a humble organization that is still struggling at DM, especially in terms of finances. So our reach and our work is always limited by the, um, the limitation in funding. 
given what I've just said, I would like to speak a little a bit on our successes and part of the work that we've done and been able to, su to succeed in it, which is also their reference uh, 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 to you as students. One of the things, okay, within the CGE, we, we operate within three departments. We have a legal department, we have a research, a research department, and we have an, edu an education um, and information sharing department. I just want to make one example. Um, the CGE has successfully tackled several cases that seem to hold back the progress and the realization of gender equality in the country. One case worth to mention, since we have you as students, is the case where the CGE had to do a um, an investigation and came up with findings on a bursary scheme which was termed Utukela Bursary for Maidens. I don't know if people do remember that bursary, where one of our municipalities wanted to award bursaries after you have been tested and proved to be a virgin. So, yes. Um, our legal department, our legal department then under, came in there and did an investigation and came up with fund, findings and recommendations that had pointed out to all the ills that uh, this bursary is actually creating and enforcing instead of uh, resolving a challenge. One of the challenges that the bursary was looking at was saying if we, if they promote and award bursaries for um, for, for you as a girl child to remain pure, it addresses a lot of issues. One, one of the criteria you had to, to be coming from an underprivileged family, so that gives an opportunity for an underprivileged child to go to university, which is, well, that's good. Challenge now that we were also, that we also highlighted in the findings is the issue of um, you have to be a virgin we felt that that criteria did not look at the issues that has forced people, has caused people to lose their virginity. It is not always the fact that, hey, Uzanelu Bafana. It is also, we, we know the schedule of, of rape and um, that our young girls are faced with. But most importantly, Uzongbulala Ngapa Umama. Most importantly, we felt that this is only speaking about a certain group which practices a cultural practice that is only practiced by a minority. And we felt that the bursary is utilizing public funds to promote one group in the community. What about um, Indians, Indian girls in that community who do not practice virginity testing? They were already out. So, after working with the, with the municipality, we were able to come to terms that uh, they rescind that decision um, of, of, the, uh, of the bursary awarding, but those that were already awarded the bursary, we recommended that they continue to be given the bursary to enjoy the bursary, which did happen. And then we implored the, the, the municipality to come up with a different scheme that will be suitable for, um, for, for the whole society. That is one. I would like to also highlight the legal work which we call investigation on transformation in institutions of higher learning. I want to highlight, uh, advocate, that um, for CGE, UNIZULU is very important for the reasons that you alluded to in terms of your location, in terms of the historic uh, positioning of, of, of the community around the university and mainly, mostly, the students that are taken at the university. If you look at the, the what is it called, PA score or whatever, this score, that the points that you need to, to be accepted at the university, you'll find a lot of universities, they are, their points are very, very high, but with UNIZULU, it's, there's, there's some form of leniency, which does not mean that the students at UNIZULU are less capable as, of, as compared to the other students. But the, 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 the students at, Uni, at UNIZULU and the UNIZULU itself um, is a special case for the CGE. For that reason, we did an investigation on transformation in the institution of higher learning and we picked UNIZULU. Um, 
I'm not going to take time to uh, discuss our findings on that one. You, you are welcome to go, to go into our website. The report is there. Um, again, we have recently started uh, to, to have these hearings and investigation with uh, Coastal College. Many a times, um, many a times we've noted that a lot of focus is placed at the universities and the colleges and the FET and the TVET colleges are left behind. But we have seen, uh, we have seen that gap, we have seen that gap and that is why in KZN we, we have pe uh, um, picked the Coastal College. I'm only naming and, and speaking on the institutions that are in this province, but we have uh, CGE um, offices in different provinces, so there's also more when you, if we will see when you get into our website. Having said that, what we have learned from these investigations in the institutions of higher learning is that um, there are a lot of gaps in the, especially one in the policies, policies that govern gender-based violence um, policy in the, in the university. To make it that example with a UNISUL, at UNISUL you have a, a, a policy within the university, but a lot of your students are also, which is maybe same with other universities, more than And we found that our policy only deal with the, the residents. Abasalanga are not that covered. There's, there's a gap there, and we found we found a lot of students who tibaya limala ngapande. Besel langa pagati nyuvesi iti asingeni nda wongoba au limali langa lagiti nanga pagati. So that was one of the gaps that was found. But again, across across universities, across institutions, we found a, a minister. Uh, this this this. This disease, this virus of uh, marks for sex. You will hear how I put it. I said marks for sex. I didn't say sex for marks. Because in our investigation, we have found that it's actually the person that has power to give the marks that asks for sex. It, 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 our evidence has not pointed to um, the student offering sex to get marks but we have evidence has pointed to someone saying and offering marks for sex. So that's why we, we, we rather call it marks for sex. Um, again, as I've said that the, the biggest lack is in, in terms of policies. Most critical also uh, findings is the issue of the women's representation at the professorship level. Universities uh, are very shy in appointing women and in supporting women through funding women-led research programs. When, you, when we looked at the, at, at the levels in terms of professors, the numbers are very skewed. You will find that the professors are mainly male and the color is mainly white, which also is a biggest challenge in terms of um, attaining gender equality within the space of institutions of um, of higher learning. Um, with the interest of time, before Asia then come and remove me here, <laughs> as part of an, our endeavor to emancipate men, our research department conducted a series of studies. Among these is a study on fatherhood. I wanted to highlight this because there's always a misconception that the, the Commission for Gender Equality is a commission for women. We are a commission for gender equality where there's injustice that is a, a, a limiting a men's a, a access to their rights. We also um, um, focus on that. So in 2021, last year, we did a, a study on fatherhood. This study was looking at the relations. Um, it was actually examining the challenges encountered by unmarried, divorced, and or separate, uh, separated fathers in accessing their parental responsibilities and enjoying equal right to conduct with their children. From, from, from the maintenance court, we will understand that the issue of paying up health is, 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 is important, and, and I also agree to that. You pay for your, um, the maintenance of your child, but separation of the public health and my access to my child as the father, 
that's where, as the Commission for Gender Equality, we wanted to intervene to make sure that, um, as we have seen evidence saying that uh, many of the social ills that we see in the country is because of the absence in fathers in the lives of their children. So we need to also start to addressing that issue. To what is causing this absence? And where possible, can we be able to address these issues? Um, so that one, one study that our research department was looking at. Important in a, uh, uh, to also mention here is the issue of a, a study that we conducted, which is known as the cultural rights versus the gender rights. The purpose of the study was to assess the extent of gender mainstreaming by examining programs and plans of the provincial house of traditional leaders. This was done in line with the provision of the existing pieces of legislation that seek to promote gender equality within the space of the traditional leadership. You, you will also remember that um, traditional leadership has, has a policy that guides them, that guides them that when they elect their, their council, it has to have a, a certain number of uh, women representation. And our investigation has, has shown in that they don't comply. Um, many a times they, do, they don't comply with, uh, um, with that uh, uh, provision. So that's part of the, um, of, of the, of the findings that we, get, we got. As I've said before, like any other organization, the CGE has its own challenges, uh, which is uh, uh, one of them is our limited budget um, and, our lim and the limited resources, especially human resources to, resources to fulfill such a huge mandate. Here in Deben, our office is here, is here in Deben for KZN, but we are servicing the whole of the province. In closing, I can see by the corner of my eye that ASEA is moving. <laughs> in closing, I'd like to make a call to the institutions of higher learning to actively emancipate themselves, maybe even lead the country in finding solutions to the challenges, especially the social ills that hinder attainment of gender equality. Particularly, I want to make a call advocate uh, and on maybe a question, what is the role of institutions of higher learning in research if it doesn't inform policy development? Across a number of challenges that we have, like GPV, I, most of you were young when we started, uh, when we started to experience the issue of HIV AIDS. But we saw health, the health sector, civil society, institutions on, of higher learning stood up, came very strong to ensure that we get a cure, that we also st start to, to change our behaviors. That, that's the role institutions of higher learning played. But we don't see currently wha what is it that they are doing to address these social ills. I ask you all, you are students, you write uh, dissertations, you write PhDs. What's the good of your research and your PhD findings and recommendations if it's sitting in those archives where only yourselves as scholars, when they Google what to do, Google Scholar or Scholar Google, I can't remember what you call it, only yourselves that are able to access that, the, the findings and your information, but it helps no one. Worse, better still, you go to a community to do research. You get your research, you get your master's, you get your PhD. You've left with the, that community with nothing. You don't even come back to assist based on the findings that you came up with. I want to recommend that start a legacy where we see the, your role as in the academia changing. I would like to conclude by two quotes from Data Matiba. I quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, that one quote. The last quote is, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Commission on Gender Equality. And as you rightfully said, you, do, you talk about gender equality across the board. And I think your studies are quite clear that it's not female or male, it's across the board. And I'd like you all to take note of what Ms. Ndwane said about research and take, going back to your communities and doing some good. 
uh, for your community uh, once you have been done. Don't let it sit on a shelf and collect dust. So thank you very much for those words. I think it's touched many who are here today. I'd like to then go on to introduce Dr. S.M. Feto. Did I say that right? Uh, Dr. Feto is the Deputy Chairperson of the Cultural, Religious and Linguistic Commission. She has uh, 20 years, after 20 years of the pub, in the public service, she took a sabbatical uh, and she's currently a member of the National Executive Committee of Contralisa. She holds numerous post-grad qualifications from various institutions. We are sure of that. That's why we're calling her doctor today. She has a doctoral degree in political science, a master's in peace studies and international relations. She has a BA degree in communications, and she was appointed by His Excellency the President Cyril Ramaphosa to serve as a commissioner to the CRL Rights Commission in the capacity of Deputy Chair. <laughs> if she isn't a role model for us today, then there's nothing more to say. Please come on stage. Dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much, Program Director. Deputy Minister, Honorable John Jeffrey, distinguished guests, all students present here today, Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by thanking the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development for inviting me and my institution to be part of this esteemed audience, the leaders of the next generation. On the 7th of April, 1994, while speaking in mid rent at a cultural dinner party, made up of Greek, Spanish, Australian, Chinese, and Indian communities, our late former President Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, we truly have many cultures, yet we are one nation. We are truly diverse, yet we are bound together in a common destiny in the southern part of Africa. Yes, we are all South Africans. That's what he said. Program director, as a person coming from a Chapter 9 institution, whose mandate is to protect and promote the right of different religions, cultures, and languages, Every day I have a privilege to see and understand what the former president Nelson Mandela was talking about. To me, a diverse culture, religion, and language within communities of South Africa represents a tapestry of communities that live per one line, just one line, in a preamble of our constitution which says, and I quote, we, the people of South Africa, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. That's what he said. It is therefore an honor and privilege to be standing here before you to share with you the role of the commission with the longest name Commission for the Protection and Promotion of the Rights of Religious, Cultural, and Linguistic Communities, CRL Rights Commission. You have it right if you can have 
the three components. Culture, religion, and language. You can start with either of the three, but just mention the three. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a common cause that the system of apartheid was not only designed to take the land and dignity away from our people, but it is also a system that was used to diminish the heritages of our people in as far as culture, religion, and language are concerned. There are three things which are a core that makes a human being. Your culture, your religion, and your language. Those are the primary concerns of the CRL Rights Commission. In Chapter 9 of the Constitution, the Constitution establishes six independent institutions supporting constitutional democracy. They are public protector, number one, human rights commission, number two, the commission for gender equality, number three, number four, auditor general, number five, independent electoral commission. This were the five institutions that were first established by the Constitution. Only in 1996, the Constitutional Assembly added yet another institution, the last born of the Chapter 9 institutions, the commission that promotes and protects the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. That is the commission I am working at. These institutions are independent, they are partial, and do their work without fear or favor. They provide a link between the citizens and government. They are not part of government. They are not a branch in government. They work independently. Do we get that right? They work independently. They are not part of government, but they are part of the state. I know law students would understand the difference between government and the state. So this has been evident in recent public and investigative hearings and the extensive research reports prompted by the large number of complaints received from the citizens about government's failure to fulfill its obligations. The CRL Rights Commission is established to strengthen constitutional democracy within specific rights of culture, religion, and linguistic communities. This mandate is provided under section 1811C and 185 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996. And it is further expressed by the Commission for the Protection and Promotion of Rights of Culture, Religion, and Linguistic Communities Act that is number 19 of 2002. The primary objective of the CRL Commission, amongst others, to promote and develop peace, friendship, humanity, tolerance, national unity amongst cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. That is based on equality, and non-discrimination and association. The commission is also meant to promote the respect of the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. And also to promote, to monitor, investigate, research, 
educate, lobby, advise, and report on issues concerning the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. Program director. Our late President Mandela left us a legacy of peace, a legacy of friendship, a legacy of humanity, a legacy of tolerance, national unity, equality, and non-discrimination. These values are core to the objects of CRL Rights Commission. Every day we make it our mission as CRL Rights Commission to mediate peace, humanity, tolerance, and inequality between communities fighting each other over diverse religion, diverse culture, and diverse linguistics. We have we, the unit within the CRL Rights Commission which receives complaints from the members of the public in as far as culture, religion, and language are concerned. Unfortunately, these complaints range from intolerance, discrimination, ignorance, disrespect, and non-equality of other minor religions, languages, and, and cultures. Even the drafters of our constitution never thought that one day, just one day, a pastor will be found sexually harassing a member of a congregation. They never planned for that. They never thought that one day, just one man in a village can wake up, take a knife, and say, I'm going to circumcise the boys. I will force them. I will kidnap them. But I will circumcise them anyway. They never budgeted for that. But unfortunately, CRL is dealing with such cases today. As a commission, we also have a unit that goes around to engage communities and share with the public the values of peace, humanity, tolerance, and non-discrimination, especially as far as religion, culture, and linguistics are concerned. Through his work and lived experiences, Madiba taught us that embracing your identity should not come at the expense of humanity. You must know who you are, where you come from, what do you believe in. Nobody should come from Ethiopia. Nobody should come from Malawi and tell you that he has brought a new God. And then you go after this guy because he, he has a new God in his hand. You must know who you are. Why you are on this earth? Madiba taught us that it is important for us to know who we are and where, who we, where, where we come from. So it is embarrassing today that we, we find people following the new Christmas God that they are sold by foreigners. It is so embarrassing. And as a state institution, we don't even know how we educate people. That it is so wrong. It is wrong. Yes, people have a right to believe. But please be careful. The recent events of unrest in KwaZulu-Natal have shown that we still have a long way to go in building more inclusive society. Our economic inequality and poverty continues to fuel hostility among South African population. Today, I urge us to collectively examine the probing question to the legal students and everyone else. Is social cohesion possible 
in a society where there is high rate of unemployment, economic inequality, poverty, and social injustice. Is social cohesion possible? When you have a rich family on the other side and you have a poor family on the, on the other side, do you think it is possible for you to bridge social cohesion to both families? That is what we are trying to do as a commission. We hope we will get there at some point. You see, social justice cannot be actualized or activated if there is no peace. When the state fails to build solidarity, people fall back to tribal and religious divisions as reactionary means of survival. The challenge that we have as South Africa is to enhance social cohesion and foster the development of a shared South African identity that incorporates diversity in a democratic dispensation. This relates directly to translation of the rights and responsibilities of both the state and its citizens into social reality. In conclusion, Program Director, our CRL Rights Commission's mandate mirrors so much the legacy left by the President Mandela. For us as a society and as a nation, we must remember and uphold our collective and individual roles and responsibilities as active citizens. How we choose to come together in solidarity to build systems of accountability that strives towards peace and justice can truly forge transgenerational impact and sustainable change. And I quote, I quote the great rock of Kunu, Nelson Mandela once more, when he said, it is in your hands to make a difference. Yes, he said that. And for us, ladies and gentlemen, I, I do acknowledge that much has been done by our government, but there are miles to go still before we all perish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fetter. I think that was very, very thought provoking. And I think, you know, hand in hand with Nelson Mandela's quote, we must be united in our diversity. You spoke about tolerance. Uh, throughout, that was your, your the, the key word, tolerance for different cultures, religions, and languages. So thank you very, very much. To move on to our program, I'd like to introduce Mr. Isa. He's the provincial chairperson of the Legal Practice Council. We all know that the Legal Practice Council is the statutory body that monitors uh, the conduct of attorneys and advocates that are practicing in the country. Mr. Isa is a practicing attorney for approximately 31 years. Ooh, we weren't even around, some of us. Huh? No, not me, not me. Uh, he was the president of the KZN Law Society. He served on numerous boards as a commissioner. He has been with Nadell for approximately three decades. He is a practitioner and has expertise in various areas of law. He's also a lecturer at the PLT. And all his uh, presentations to these attorneys contributes to his maintenance of the professional standards of persons who provide legal services. So for those of you who are going to do PLT once you are done, take note of Mr. Isa's face and remind him that you met him at a student lecture on this day. I'd like to welcome Mr. Isa. Good afternoon. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, Honorable Minister, Deputy, Deputy Minister of Justice, 
uh, and alumni of the university in KZN uh, during about the same time that I studied. So and there's somebody else who's got that 31 years of experience. Uh, <laughs> distinguished guests, panelists, students, leaders in the uh, legal profession that are seated in front here. Um, I would like to commence by just correcting uh, the program director. I used to lecture at the university, the PLT course, and uh, perhaps I should start from that point, and that is I heard uh, Advocate Sogoni talk about the fact that PLT is uh, non-existent in the University of Zululand. Students, I can assure you that in the front seat here are some very influential people. Apart from the minister, you've got a direct line to the Ministry of Justice. But apart from that, you have in front of you here the chairperson of the KZN Black Lawyers Association. You have in front of you here the chairperson of Nadal in this region. And you have before you here the director of the Legal, provincial Legal Practice Council. So I can give you the assurance that that message is going to go back to all these stakeholders so as to ensure that the University of Zululand has PLT. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, let me commence by saying that the legacy of Madiba is personified from his being as an innocent child to the triumphs and pressures of being the country's first black president. His devotion to the attainment of uh, civil rights and liberties is the epitome of selflessness. He remained a devoted champion of peace and justice. And it is that challenge that one needs to aspire to. Justice being attained without fear favor and prejudice and all role players playing their part in that process. Madiba was uncompromising in his demands for the attainment of justice. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, Madiba famously once said. And as an example of walking the talk, he himself attained a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of London whilst in prison. The fight for women's rights, the fight against HIV AIDS, the issue of education, children's rights, and the fight for peace and justice are just some of the issues that personify his legacy. And it is noteworthy that the issue of justice was crucial in him being a lawyer by profession some of you in the not dis too distant future are going to be. Now for me, the single issue that has made a difference in the legal profession in more recent times is the advent of the Legal Practice Act in 2018. And we must give thanks to the leaders of the profession who you see in front of you here, as well as the Deputy Minister of Justice, who I am aware of spend an inordinate amount of time to making that a realization. Now let me give you perhaps the most significant difference between the legal profession prior to the Legal Practice Act and now. The legal profession was regulated in terms of the Attorneys Act. And in those days, you used to have the law societies and that too, four law societies and the Law Society of South Africa. Post the Legal Practice Act, you now have the Legal Practice Council. The Legal Practice Council is made up of 23, I wouldn't say practitioners, they are 10 attorneys, six advocates, uh, a member from the Fidelity Fund, a member of the Legal Aid, academics. So it's a broad spectrum of people that now regulate the profession. Prior to that, you had the law societies. The law societies 
used to be known as the Custer's mores of the profession. They wore two caps, the trade union cap and the regulatory cap. What you have now is the Legal Practice Council as the regulator. What you have now is nine provincial councils. And I've been introduced as the chairperson of the KZN Provincial Council. But what you have is essentially a single statutory entity regulating the profession. So now the Legal Practice Council, in terms of the Legal Practice Act, regulates the profession. But what is the focus? The focus is, and the object of the act, is the public interest. To give you some background, the purpose of the act is defined in section three of the Legal Practice Act. Firstly, to provide a legislative framework for the transformation and restructuring of the legal profession that embraces the values underpinning the constitution and ensures that the rule of law is upheld. Most significant, the constitution and ensuring and providing that legislative framework. Secondly, broadening access to justice by putting in place, firstly, something that's dear to my heart, and that is a mechanism to determine fees chargeable by legal practitioners for legal services rendered that are within the reach of the citizenry. Let's talk about that. It talks about access to justice. It talks about fees and what do practitioners charge? What ought practitioners to charge when they win a case? Those are very, very important concepts. And what this act has introduced is for the South African Law Reform Commission in the last two years to have done an investigation into the whole issue of fees by talking to different stakeholders so as to ensure that there is access to justice and fees are brought within the reach of the citizenry. That report of the South African Law Reform Commission has been presented to the Honorable Minister of Justice and he will consider same in due course. And there are complex questions to be answered when it comes to that particular issue. And I'll give you the simple example. The example from the legal profession to the medical profession. As far as the medical profession is concerned, there are hospitals, public hospitals, but then there are private hospitals. So the citizenry has access to medical care via the public hospitals. Similarly, in the legal profession, one has uh, the legal aid centers, the justice centers. And as far as that entity is concerned, the question is whether that adequately takes into account the needs of the citizenry. I can assure you that that report is in excess of 500 pages, prepared by Judge Kolopin and his colleagues. And very interesting questions are asked as to how do you resolve the issue of legal costs in the context of the South African legal profession. The second issue uh, in broadening access to justice is measures to provide for the rendering of community service by candidate legal practitioners and practicing legal practitioners. Significantly, it talks about community service. But what about pro bono? One has to consider pro bono in the same context as community service. Thirdly, measures that provide equal opportunities for all aspirant legal practitioners in order to have a legal profession that broadly reflects the demographics of the republic. Fourthly, to create a single unified statutory body to regulate the affairs of all legal practitioners and all candidate legal practitioners in pursuit of the goal of an accountable, efficient, and independent legal profession. So there must be synergy between the Legal Practice Council and the nine provincial councils so as to ensure that goal. Next, to protect and promote the public interest. The public is of significant importance in the context of the Legal Practice Act. Then to provide for the establishment of an Office of the Legal Services Ombud. I can tell you now that the Legal Services Ombud's office from June is up and running. Judge Siraj Desai has been appointed as the Ombud and his office is now 
basically up and running. The next is to provide a fair, effective, and transparent process or procedure for the resolution of complaints against legal practitioners and candidate legal practitioners, and also to create a framework for the development and maintenance of professional ethical norms and standards, regulation of, for the admission of and enrollment of practitioners, and the development of adequate training programs for legal practitioners and candidate legal practitioners. The program director has given me uh, very limited time. I can go on forever here. But I want to say to you that the establishment of the Legal Practice Council and the nine provinces are responsible for the regulation and also responsible for the consideration of professional conduct and the establishment of disciplinary structures. I'm sure lots of you would have seen those lovely, uh, well, I shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, you would have seen cases being televised live and you have to consider the ethics uh, of some of those legal practitioners. And those matters have been referred to the, or at least some of them, to the South African Legal Practice Council. I'm going to conclude by saying that the strides made by the Legal Practice Council in terms of the Legal Practice Act are the accredi accreditation of legal education entities, continuing legal training for legal practitioners, the training of pupils, the introduction of legal sector uh, services sector code, which is the first step to facilitate the realization of a transformed legal, legal profession, and the creation of a benevolent fund to legal practitioners, some of whom could not even buy themselves food at the time during COVID. The issues that the profession are grappling with inter alia are the issues in the Act which require amendment. One example is pro bono. Secondly, the appointment of the Appeals Tribunal, which is a more cost-effective way uh, to consider an adverse le finding in a disciplinary hearing. And I'm going to ask the Deputy Minister to please take that point home to ensure that the Appeals Tribunal is formed as soon as possible. And then a more effective engagement with stakeholders in the profession. And some of the stakeholders, for example, are the different interest groups. Uh, as I've indicated, Nadel, the BLA, and the Law Society of South Africa are those interest groups. They are represented here, and the issue raised by Advocate Sogoni is going to go home very quickly. The RPC, in conclusion, is the responsible regulator in ensuring that the objects of the RPC Act are fulfilled, both in upholding of the rule of law as well as in the administration of justice. And before I leave this platform of students, I just want to pass a message to you. There has to be access to justice. I've told you about education, etc. I want to also remind you that there are bursaries out there, the LPIIF. When you become a candidate legal practitioner, I'm sure you can knock on the doors of SACITA to ensure that you get a stipend as far as SACITA is concerned. And so to that extent, there is no bar to entry into the profession and to ensure that you make the best possible legal practitioner in the profession. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Issa, for those inspiring words. I think lots of the information you shared is very critical to our students who are here, although all of them are not law students. Am I correct? Yes, so we are cater we're trying to cater for all of you, but we're also trying to keep in line with the theme of, Man of Mandela Month and commemoration of 25 years of the Constitution. And uh, Mr. Issa spoke very strongly about access to justice, access to funds, uh, um, pro bono work. So thank you very much for your information. For the inf and we wait and for the report that is currently sitting with the minister. On that note, we are going to do a very quick, Deputy Minister doesn't like us to introduce him, but I'm, no DM, I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> I've got your biography here. I'm going to read it. They all want to know who you are. Am I right? Yes. yes. So we can take two minutes to introduce the Deputy Minister of Justice. John Jeffrey, Member of Parliament, is South Africa's Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. He studied law at the University of Natal and holds a BA and LLB degree, as well as a postgrad diploma in, environment, in environmental law, which I didn't know, dear all from the University of Natal. He's an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa. 
He is a member of the ruling party, the African National Congress. He's actually here for their provincial conference, so we hijacked him. After South Africa's transition to a constitutional democracy in 1994, Deputy Minister became a member of the KwaZulu-Natal Provincial Legislature, where he chaired the Environment, Environment and Conservation Portfolio Committee. DM has been a member of the National Assembly of Parliament since 1999. He is a former member of the Portfolio Committee of Justice and Constitutional Development, where he was instrumental in shaping a number of pieces of legislation, such as the Sexual Offences and Related Amendments Act and the Child Justice Act of 2008. He held the position of Parliamentary Councillor to the President and Deputy President from 1999 to July 2013, serving under President Mbeki, Mutlante, and Zuma. He was appointed as Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development in July 2013 and reappointed in 2019 by President Cyril Ramaphosa for a second term of office, which we're very grateful for. Our Deputy Minister, our Deputy Minister is passionate about justice, human rights, and constitutional awareness. Let's welcome Deputy Minister. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everybody. You can be seated. Um, good afternoon and welcome to you all. Um, I must say, as a former student of the University of Natal, uh, but by the way, it was University of Natal, Peter Maritzburg. That's now University of KwaZulu-Natal. I heard there are people from Howard College here. Is there anyone here from UKZN, Peter Maritzburg? Your Apart from, apart from uh, Asraf. Um, firstly, just an apology. I'm a bit uh, sick, as you can probably hear from my voice, but I thought it was, would be important to still come and honor this obligation rather than all the preparations um, being, being wasted. As you know, the 18th of July has been declared International Nelson Mandela Day, with the month of July having been declared by the South African government as Mandela Month. Uh, so, Mandela Day is international, it's not just South Africa. Mandela Month, though, calls on South Africans and the world at large to play their part in making the world a better place. This year is the 13th anniversary of the start of Nelson Mandela International Day. The Nelson Mandela International Day campaign rem rem uh, remains rooted in the call Madiba made in 2009 to honor him by working in communities rather than celebrating his birthday. So he was somebody who didn't want parties. He rather said, do things for the people uh, to celebrate my birthday. In November 2009, in, honoring, in honor of his contribution to the culture of peace and freedom, the United Nations General Assembly declared the 18th of July as Nelson Mandela International Day. That UN resolution recognizes Mandela's values and his dedication to the service of humanity in conflict resolution, race relations, the promotion and protection of human rights, reconciliation, gender equality, and the rights of children and other vulnerable groups, the fight against poverty, and the promotion of social justice. The resolution also acknowledges his contribution to the struggle for democracy internationally and the promotion of a culture of peace throughout the world. Mandela Day was initially launched in two cities, and it's now celebrated in over 200 countries. But what does it mean for us today? The global theme for 2022 is do what you can with what you have wherever you are. The context, of course, is a world in which inequality continues to grow and in which the destructive impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated existing disparities. The call to action as broad as, it, as inclusive as, as possible identifies those in need, is to identify those around you in need and do what you can to make a difference. In his Mandela Day message earlier this month, the United Nations Secretary General said, and I quote, our world today is marred by war, overwhelmed by emergencies, blighted by racism, discrimination, 
poverty and inequalities and threatened by climate disaster. Let us find hope in Nelson Mandela's example and inspiration in his vision. Today and every day, let us honor Nelson Mandela's legacy by taking action, by speaking against hate and standing up for human rights. That's the end of the quote. So how do we do that? How do we, either as individuals or as groups of concerned people, stand up for human rights? And how do we promote a culture of human rights? Most importantly, how can the youth play a part in this? In order to promote human rights, we need to take a critical look at the world in which we live. The Civicus 2021 State of Civil Society mentions that great waves of protest have swept across every inhabited continent as people have risen in huge numbers to demand democracy and human rights. It mentions how movements such as Black Lives Matter and Me Too have rippled across the world to challenge embedded exclusion and to demand a radical reckoning with systemic racism and patriarchy. These movements have shifted discourse and changed political priorities. Importantly, we've seen the same in our country. Just think of the fees must fall and the presidential uh, summit on GBV following the hashtag total shutdown. But, says the report, this is this, the International Civicus report, the last 10 years have also seen considerable backlash from peop to people's demands for change. Globally, civic, conditions, civic space conditions have deteriorated, and in many countries, troubling forces of nationalism and popularism have resurged. They refer to it as the anti-rights backlash. With the rise of social media, we know that disinformation, hate speech, fake news, and conspiracy theories carry a real risk to the advances made in the area of human rights. And just as somebody who's on social media, particularly Twitter, when somebody says something, and those of you that are lawyers or law students, it doesn't mean that it's true. You know, so somebody can come out with an outrageous fact, and what startles, astonishes me is how many people just believe it. Uh, people have got other reasons for spreading misinformation, so please, when you get something on Twitter or on social media, interrogate it. Could this be true? Where does this come from? What's the source? That kind of thing. Um, in an article last year, the World Economic Forum stated that young people are the most affected by the crisis facing our world. The chairperson of the World Economic Forum argues that young people today are coming to age in a world beset by crises. He makes the point, correctly so in my view, that even before the devastating impact of COVID-19, the socio-economic systems of the past had put the, the livability of the planet at risk and eroded the pathway to healthy, happy, fulfilled lives for, uh, for too many. It resulted in creating inequality, social discord, and climate change we see today, along with a widening generational wealth gap and a youth debt burden. Importantly, he says that young people are right to be deeply concerned and angry. But, says the World Economic Forum, the youth are the people with the most innovative ideas and energy to build a better society for tomorrow. This is also something that Mandela himself firmly believed in, the power of the youth to bring about change. When he received an honorary doctorate from UKZN in May 1998, he said, and I quote, the future belongs to our youth. As some of us near the end of our political careers, younger people must take over. They must seek and cherish the most basic condition for peace, namely unity in our diversity, and finding lasting ways to that goal. Now, I'm told that most of you here today are part of what is known as Generation Z. Uh, that Generation Zs are those who were born roughly between 1995 and 2012. So obviously you won't have many people born after 2012 because they're still little, but I don't know if most of you were born between, before 1995. And that you've got Generation Z have specific characteristics which distinguish them from other generations, such as the Generation Xs, the Baby Boomers, and the Millennials. According to an article in Forbes, 
magazine, the Generation Zs have long pushed for social change as research indicates that they believe the world has reached a tipping point on issues such as racial justice, inequality, and the environment. In short, your generation, the Generation Zs, are taking action to drive the change they want to see in the world. They are said to be more politically involved. They believe in their individual power to make a difference, but they're also demanding that businesses and governments do their part to help build a better future. For us here in South Africa, the youth cannot be sidelined. Young people between the ages of 15 and 35 make up just over one third of our population. Any government who ignores the voices of the youth do so at their peril. And you must hold us to account. How often do you engage with democratic institutions, if at all? And if you do engage with the state, how responsive is the state, if at all? Are you as young people aware of the work being done by the Chapter 9 institutions? You've heard from uh, two of them here today. Uh, do you know where to go when your human rights are infringed? And how do we as a country raise human rights awareness and constitutional rights education? These are all questions that we need to debate in order to ensure that our youth feel empowered and part of our country's democracy. One of the most prominent acts of youth activism was the 1976 student uprising. The memory of young people confronted, thanks, confronting an armed police force with stones to challenge the injustices of the apartheid system will remain vivid in many people's minds for many years to come. Young people have established a solid foundation in building South Africa, uh, South Africa that values and respects human rights. This year's celebration of the 25th anniversary of the coming into effect of the Constitution is the ideal time for a renewed energy from our youth in, promote, in the promotion of our constitutional and human rights. In celebrating 25 years of the Constitution, young people need to remain conscious of the responsibility that accompanies our constitutional rights and fundamental freedoms. We must all work together to intensify awareness of the Constitution and to inspire change. We cannot yet rest and say we've achieved and attained the type of society that the Constitution envisages. We haven't, we are far from it. Many in our country still face discrimination, prejudice, poverty, inequality, and other challenges. These challenges stay in the, stand in the way of freedom, equality, and dignity for all. When we hear someone making discriminatory or prejudicial remarks, do we call them out or do we just remain silent? Uh, you've heard of, of, I mean, you're well aware of the problems of gender-based violence. A lot of that is caused by patriarchy, uh, basically the attitude of, of men. Um, and so when men are, when your friends, if you're, if you're men, if you're male students, if your friends are talking about um, who they had sex with and what type of person that is and making derogatory comments about the ladies You call them out you say no, that's not right because you should uh, The problem with with why there's so much abuse of women is because men think women are their possessions South Africa's Constitution has been hailed as one of the most progressive in the world and our transition to democracy has been a beacon and an inspiration to many in the world but democracy and freedom are things that we must defend, strengthen, and safeguard continuously. And we do this, as we do this, may you be inspired by the very famous words of Nelson Mandela when he said, I have discovered that the secret, um, I've discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I don't know if any of you have tried climbing mountains, but you climb, 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 and it's tough, and you see the top there, and then you get there and there's more top that you couldn't see. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I've come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibility and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not yet ended. Thank you. Um, uh, you, you don't have to, I, I just did want to uh, sort of respond to two of the issues raised. So firstly, to Mr. Esser, 
um, this uh, um, the section of the, the that you you had said um, uh, needs to, well needs to come into effect. Uh, the um, legal practice ombud presented a list of names last week, and so now the, the legal practice council nationally is is urging or is asking the minister to put I think it's section 25 into effect. And then on Advocate Sogoni's uh, question, uh, sorry, this deputy minister's on the ball, so I've done other other research <laughs> while I've been sitting up here. Um, the the um, uh, practical legal training PLT is is run by the Law Society of South Africa, which is a, a private uh, body. However, what I'm told by them is that they want a minimum of 25 students to be able to do the PLT at, at a university. I mean, it's the, you don't have to be at the university, you'll have graduated, but to use the university facilities. I don't know if 25 has been a problem. Uh, for the UZ students here, I, I don't know how many of you would be wanting to, to do um, to do practical legal training, but anyway, we'll work on we'll work on the on the issue. It may be that the numbers were a problem, but maybe while I'm still on the floor, um, one of one of the things that keeps me up at night that makes me very worried is the large number of unemployed LLB graduates, and. Um, um, look, we, 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 you could say we've got too many lawyers in South Africa, but we haven't. I did an exercise a few years ago where you take the total population of South Africa and you divide it by the total number of the practicing attorneys and the practicing advocates. And a few years ago, it worked out that there was one lawyer, one practicing advocate or attorney to 1,986 people. So one lawyer had to cover those, those people. And if you compare uh, us to other developing countries, Brazil, I think it's like one to 500. So we need a lot more lawyers. The problem is with the structure of our economy and the concentrations of wealth, that most people can't afford lawyers. And that's where the uh, Law Reform Commission report that um, uh, Mr. Issa referred to is uh, very important. But there's also things that I'd want to challenge um, uh, the, the Legal Practice Council, Nardell and BLA. Can't we do more to get positions for candidate attorneys? I'm told that I think one attorney can take three candidate attorneys in any one year. Um, but most are not doing that because they can't afford it. But then it's an issue of, you mentioned the CECITA, which does give funding. Um, can't, they, uh, can't they fund more people? And then while we were talking about practical legal training, if you do the practical legal training and you pass the exam, you only have to do one year's articles, not two. Now, this is the challenge to um, the council and the uh, Nadell and the BLA. Many law firms, particularly the bigger ones, as I understand it, and I'm waiting for more detailed evidence, are saying to a PLT graduate, it's preferred that you do two years. Now, when you're a young person who's looking for articles and you've done PLT, but you really want uh, this, this, this position, if they say it's preferred, you're probably going to think, if I don't say, yes, I'll do two years, they won't give me the job. But I think that's something that the Law, the LPC and, and the attorney's bodies needs to look at because if we can enforce that if a person has done PLT, they only do one year's articles, then we actually have doubled, at least from that uh, group of people, the number of people we can, give, um, we can give articles to. So thank you, thank you very much. And um, sorry, just one other thing. Uh, um, yeah, I, I look forward to, to your questions, your, your, your comments, your inputs. It's often difficult knowing how to pitch something, what are you actually interested in at the moment, those kinds of things, so let me hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, you know, I think you're one of the few uh, members of Parliament who will say, 
we must hold you to account. And we're very grateful for that. I think it's something that uh, politicians don't want to be told or don't want to say hold us to account. And I also like the fact that you said that with our constitution comes rights and responsibilities. I think that's very important. As much as we have rights, we have responsibilities as well. So thank you very, very much, Deputy Minister, for that. Uh, to the uh, bodies, statutory bodies, and our attorneys who are here today, take note of what Deputy Minister has said about empowering and hiring our law graduates so that they can get out there and increase access to justice for all. On that note, I'm now going to open up the podium. Oh, sorry, yes. OK, OK. I'm now going to open up the uh, stage for Q&A session. I believe we do have roving mics. Uh, Bega, do we have roving mics? We're going to take first a show of five hands, and then we'll do the rest. Obviously, uh, we don't want to confuse it. So, Mr. Badal, you'll be the first one. Do we have anyone else? Uh, please take note, Bega. The gentleman here with the yellow band is number two. This is number one in front, number two. The gentleman here is number three. The young lady here with the orange band, I'm looking at you. Number four, the gentleman with the glasses, five. And this young lady here, six. We're going to stop there. OK? And then the others, hold your thought. Uh, number one, Mr. Badal, can we please keep our, can we please allow the person to talk? If you can introduce yourself, can we keep our questions short? Uh, so that we allow more engagement uh, between all of us. Mr. Badal. Thank you, Chair. I'm one of the comrades, one of the Generation Z, uh, Deputy Minister. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. That's a joke, right? <laughs> um, I've heard all the speeches today, and they're very inspiring, but I think it's important that Shh, when colleagues. we leave this, this area here with all these inspiring speeches, that, that they're not just speeches, they have to be followed by action. While I was sitting here, uh, yeah, while well, I was here, one second. He's definitely not Generation yeah. Z, because yeah. you know how to multitask with that phone, am I right? So, so why, while I was sitting there, I got a note from one of my colleagues from Phoenix, uh, in that area, it says, we got info this morning that Etiquini Municipality has disconnected electricity at 10 schools. There could be much more, etc. Now, these schools are have learners which come from the ink area. And the local people will know what ink means. Ink means in Nanda, in Tezuma, Pumashu. Now, it's a serious issue. Now, we talk here about human rights, but what about the human rights of those learners in those schools? They're not getting educated. There's no electricity. We, we've seen in this program here, Madiba saying that to deny people the human rights is to challenge their very humanity. The Tikrini municipality is controlled by the ruling party, by the so you know, they must answer for it. The other issue that uh, Comrade Deputy Minister raised about education, etc. For my sins, I had the body that uh, controls the practical legal schools in the country. So I'll speak to advocate after the meeting and, and discuss them. As Are you the PLT you guy? I'm the PLT Take guy. note of him. Thank you. Number two, please yes. introduce yourself. Thanks. Thanks a lot. My name is Pinda. Sorry? My name is Pinda. Pinda. Yes. Uh, uh, I want to ask, uh, well, first and foremost, I'll just give a parting shot to say uh, there will never be social cohesion if the economy is skewed like it is. The, the economy of the country is still in the hands of the oppressors. Uh, black people are not benefiting. There's no trickling. So if you, re if you address that fundamental problem, there will be social cohesion. Because they call the show, they even tell the state which laws they must promulgate that must protect themselves. Even the so-called glorified constitution is an unstarter because it still gives them a right to property. The property that we want, the, the land that we want, Cabral tells us there's, there's no struggling 
if the land question is not addressed. It needs to be addressed. The land is needed as a matter of agency. Black people must benefit from it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Comrade. Uh, that was a parting shot. Uh, I think, uh, 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 Comrade uh, Jeffries, I will give you a question for you as a ruling party member and also as a minister. Uh, and also because you are leading a department uh, that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it embodies the, 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 the judiciary to a so called so judiciary. Uh, Colleagues. Thank you, Benny Kriber, uh, former public protector to me, uh, gave a directive that the former president cannot form the commission, uh, the state capture commission, but he must give that power, abdicate that response, a constitutional responsibility to the chief justice. Whereas if it is said, it's decided to say no, because you, 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 you are also caught in the matter, President Zuma. Why didn't she say that the deputy president should have done that? Uh, fast forward now. The, 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 the suspended uh, deputy, uh, the suspended public protector, if the president questions after the Palapala Dakar uh, that happened, the president immediately suspends the public protector. What do you call that? Because the, the, the president is directly involved in that Palapala issue. Why did the, the president exercise the same authority to say no? Because I'm, 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 I'm part and parcel of this investigation. Let me give the powers to another person to do the due diligence on me to a certain extent. That would have been fairness. And we don't, we don't hear your department uh, doing this. Instead, whenever these issues come up, you came with a propaganda that has arrested in, in Dubai. To a so you are always the, your department is always placed in a situation where it is seen as if it is it is defocusing us. And you see, this matter is not going away. As a ruling party, a, a, a former minister of health, Doctor Zwe, stepped down. People said must step down when there was an allegation regarding the issue of uh, PPEs. And he stepped down voluntarily. Everyone applauded him. The president, there's an allegation, strong allegations. The case has been opened with the police. That the president is running a Ponzi scheme in his farm. He keeps money in, 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 uh, in, uh, in mattresses. Some are even saying that he always seems to be sleeping in funerals because he can't sleep the mattresses. <laughs> Okay, can you round up your question, please? You see, you know for a fact that is against the labor laws of the country because being a house helper is not part of caskets. And no one speaks about it. But that matter directly puts the president to a, 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 a broken certain rules of the country. Why is the president not stepping down? Okay. Why are you not asking the president as a ruling party? Deputy to step down? Minister will try to and answer also, that. And, and also to, 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 to make him resign because. Is the president, when he entered office, he told us in authority that is the embodiment of anti corruption. But this place in, an, in the corrupt spot, you are still supporting the president. None of you are quiet, all of you. Okay, president. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Number three. Number three, are you ready? Can we have the mic? Colleagues, if we don't quieten down, then we're going to have to have a few more questions. It defeats the purpose. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Shh. Oh, um, warm greetings to the house at large. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. I'm no, don't be. We are the most powerful people, so I keep the pleasure. But it's okay. Um, Your name? It's Kwanile. Kwanile. Yes. Um, now, first of all, Shh. I would like to thank the brother in the back. He said a lot of very important and vital things. Which brings me into a question that are the people who are setting the rules of this book, are they going by them? Are they following them? That's the reason we need high corruption nowadays. 
place, right? But uh, the main reason why I'm standing here is because I want to be the voice of the youth. What we're facing as students is being invited, right? Mm -hmm. um, the biggest issue we're facing is high unemployment rates, right? Of which there's high unemployment rates, it increases high crime, right? Because the people who are poor want to steal to, from the people who are rich because they know that if they're rich, obviously they'll make a maze to get the stuff there because they've got money to do so. Look at us today. How's the cost of living, guys? It's very comfortable. Any one of us, you know, it's very tough. So, what I'm fighting for, more especially, I won't go too much in politics. That's not my focus. Study. Um, what I'm fighting for is for the youth and the students because look at the system we have today. How unfair it is to the youth. We get people who stand in front of us and they be like they fighting for us, right? But look at us. When we try to apply for jobs or try to find an opportunity, the first thing we see in an application is that we need five or six years of experience, working experience, which is unfair for everyone, right? To be true, these people we, we talk about LLC students, right? They, they talk about they need PLT and everything, practice and everything. But to be a lawyer, they'll tell you need five, six years experience for you to be a lawyer. You need to be exposed more of experience. Check that people are in parliament. How old are they? What is our unemployment rate? Rate if you can remember, I mean, it's 65 years or 68. How old are people in parliament? Those people who set this book or those people who set the rules, how old are they? Are they giving the youth an opportunity? to be there and fight for us. We cannot be how are we going to be there? We need an opportunity. Honorable Minister, I'm so sorry. I don't need to be rude, but it's endless. I mean, angry you. Because I've studied. I'm a postgraduate student. The reason why I care on studies is because I do not get employment. Not that I don't apply, not that I don't have the experience. I don't get that opportunity because the same people who say it's fighting for me, I do not get that door. They shot me out. Who am I? I mean, nothing, right? I need my mother to be very powerful, to connect me with a powerful person for me to get a job. Ah. Which is unfair. Because there are people just like me. I come from a very previously disadvantaged background, right? There are people that we, we need to start from scratch. We don't get a handout like, okay, my father is who and who, so it's easy for me. I start from scratch. I sell vegetables to make money, right? I didn't do no crime. But if that is not progressive for me, what must I do next? Give me a solution. I've got a, there is a foundation from where I come from in Nepal, where I help paras, I'll just call it the hobos or paras whatsoever. Those people at Heba, stop in the street and talk to him. He'll speak proper English for you. He'll do mathematics for you. But he, he wasn't given a chance, so he mm. wasted his youth into doing wrong things, right? Because we've got people, it's easy to stand in front of people and say, I promise you this. Do this, I promise you this. This t it's time for, for you to deliver. It's very hard now. When I knock and you shut me off. So what I'm fighting for is that let us please be given opportunities, right? There are people in parliament who did politics, but they are over 65. They're supposed to retire. They don't even say, if I said that, how old is our president? I'm not fighting him. I don't have an issue with him. But how old are the people in parliament? Shh, there colleagues. are people who did uh, political governance. There are people who did political studies, right? They are the, they're still fresh. You say you want young and energetic people. This room is full of young and energetic students here, right? Are they given a proper chance? Okay, stay? thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Number four. Number four. Shh. Number four, here, stand up, young lady, then they can see who you are. Shh. Let's hear. Um, my warmest greetings are extended to everyone in the room. Um, I am an LLP law student. Your name? Nombe <laughs> Lomjato. I am an LLP law student at University of Zululand. I'm doing my third year. Um, there's a belief that we believe in in the South African Women Lawyers Association Student Chapter that we stand amongst shoulders of great pioneers of women. Therefore, we are tasked to preserve the now for future. And I think we are all gathered here today to also preserve the legacy of Dada Nelson Mandela for the now generation and also the future generation. But also, um, I think my concern or my question will be, are we all gathered here today to make promises or are we going to make sure that those promises are also delivered? And we spoke among, um, about the issue of PLT. And it will be so unfortunate that it is just a promise just to um, for media coverage on whatever reason. That's because the issue of PLT is something that we in university 
University of Zuliland suffer from, it is very difficult for us to get such an opportunity. So who are we going to hold accountable after these promises have been made? Have been made? I think um, the Deputy Minister also made a promise, and also Mr. Issa made that in this room we have so much influential people. So how are we going to make sure that we hold you guys accountable for everything that you have promised in this room? Because this cannot be just a media coverage. Um, moving forward to another question, it will be, um, we in University of Zulu, and, um, Advocate Sogen, Sogen has mentioned so many things that are disadvantage to us. So um, I'm not even going to go to those things, but um, as they have been mentioned, um, he, uh, Mr. Issa also mentioned that in this room, we have the chairperson of the, we have BLA, we also have Nadel. Um, I've only learned about Nadel, um, I think it was earlier this year, that we have such an organization that exists. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist in UNISUL. So there's so many opportunities that are out there that are presented um, to students in UKZN and also students in so how are we going to make sure that students in University of Zuliland also um, take the such opportunities? Advocates also mentioned that Tina, we are the stepchild. We don't want to be that. We want to make sure that if opportunities are presented to UKZN students, to UNISAT Devon students, to other students, we also get to students. It is also embarrassing that we had to travel to, to be able to receive this opportunity. We also want to see Minister of uh, Justice in, in, in our premises at UNISUL. Not just in our premises in UNISUL, but we also want to see him in Bangeni because not only is it going to be us, um, the law department students that are going to be receiving this opportunity, but we have so many more students who are left behind who are saying, why are we not receiving this opportunity? It's unfortunate, it's only 40 students are here. There's so much more who want to be here and receive this opportunity, not just in Department of Law, but in other departments. So how are we going to make sure that University of Zuliland receives the recognition that it deserves? Because we deserve this recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Number five. Just so you know, the Department of Justice does recognize you, UniZulu. We've got a very nice relationship with you, so don't forget that. Am I right, advocate? Yes. <laughs> number five? No, she was number four. We now number five. Oh, it is this young lady here. Yes. Thank you, Chair. My name is Samgel Siwem Gomezulu, and my question is going to be within the legal profession. And I'm going to ask the question because I know that um, more than who people who are here today, there's a lot of other graduates that have posed the question um, in all over South Africa. So I don't know if the Deputy Minister has had the pleasure to read the open letter which was written by Cape Town Candidates Attorney Association to the Legal Practice Council on the 4th of July, 2022. This was concerning the candidates' legal practitioners' working conditions. And just briefly, they did a survey in which uh, the most notable results showed that uh, candidates' attorneys are experiencing unfair and unlawful labor practices. Um, in a nutshell, candidates' attorneys are reluctant to challenge their employers in fear of losing the opportunity to become fully qualified. So now my question is taking into account that an oversupply of graduates are entering the private sector, what is the Department of Justice doing to bridge this gap? And um, the minister spoke about the fact that there's, there needs to be more that needs to be done. And I just want to know what is the more that is actually being done? Um, alternatively, is it a possibility that perhaps in the future the recruitment uh, and remuneration and stipend be further regulated in addition to Section uh, 27 of the Legal Practice Act? Uh, because as it stands, it seems like no one really actually cares. 
Mr. Elif touched on the issue briefly, but I feel that he didn't um, go further enough. Um, this issue is obviously old as time. My brother is 20 years older than me, and 15 years ago, he earned 3,000 rand as a candidate attorney, and it's a concern to me that when I finish next year, I'll be earning the very same amount, which is be, be below the threshold in terms of Section 35 of the basic conditions of employment. Thank you. Thank you. You can see that's a lawyer in the making. Uh, any uh, DM, do you want to answer these? Or do, do you want to? Okay, we'll take four more questions. Okay, one, two, the lady with the yellow, three, and the gentleman here, four. And then if we have a t a time, we'll take more, okay? We want to answer all questions, but we also... Okay, who's num who was first? Hello, who was first? Okay. Shh, colleagues. Good afternoon. Um, colleagues and students, my name is Mrs. Mfusi. Um, I'm the Provincial Director of the Legal Practice Council. Um, I've noted um, the concerns that have been raised. I will just touch on those that are part of, of our portfolio as the regulator for the legal profession. Let me start by saying I recognize you, you know, by the black and white that you're wearing. You look professional. You look good. Um, I'm, I'm Shh, really colleagues. concerned that you feel like the step, the stepchild. Um, so I'm going to commit, and I'm a person who stands by their word. I'm going to commit that before the end of August, I will gather the relevant stakeholders who will come to you. You won't have to come to me. I will come to you. We will deal with the bulk of your concerns. I will give you information. Um, on what to do after your degree in terms of how you integrate into the profession because I understand that it is knowledge that some of you are lacking in. How do you register articles? How do you go about doing PLT? If you do PLT, how long must you serve articles? Those questions. So I will bring my team from my office, but I'll ensure that I gather the relevant stakeholders that can also assist you to address the deficiencies in you securing articles and so forth. Um, the young lady here, uh, made a point about um, the remuneration of candidate attorneys or candidate legal practitioners, as I should say, because we are, we are now regulating both attorneys and advocates under this new act. When I come to you, we'll engage further, but just to give you an indication, the LPC has been engaging on those issues. We've called for comments from the profession, but it still remains a very touchy issue. Let me tell you why. You find in many cases that people complete the PLT and they want to serve articles. And as the Deputy Minister correctly indicated, some firms generally have a challenge with paying uh, the candidate attorneys. Now, my challenge to you is this. Before you even look at the figure, I'm not saying whether the figure is high or low, you look at what it means to be a candidate legal practitioner. This lady here owns a firm, a reputable firm. If she takes you on, She's there to impart knowledge on you. She's there to train you. So can you honestly say you want to be paid there when you are here to get information? So there are two schools of thought when it, when, when it um, relates to the remuneration that is paid to article can, uh, to candidate legal practitioners because we initially, as the LPC, thought of putting in a fixed amount. I think it was 7.5. But then there's an outcry because the average practitioner is not going to be able to accommodate you at 7.5. What then does that do? It exacerbates an existing problem of graduates sitting at home not being able to secure articles. So you will find someone else who says, listen, I'm actually just looking to get myself admitted. So even if I'm paid that 3.5 or 4,000, it is fine, I want to get admitted. So it's a challenge, it's something that we need to engage on and I'll ensure that it's something that we discuss when we come through to you so that we also uh, are able to, to draw Time from up. each other's experiences. So I will see you in August. Thank you.
Number seven. Who was number seven? The gentleman here. Were you? Do you remember your number? Who was seven? Hi, boy. You don't remember your number. Trust me, as an attorney, you'll have to remember lots of things. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Name? My name is Uyo Ndala. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm Uyo Ndala. I'm a final year law student at the University of Zulilat. I'm chairperson of the Law Students Council at the university. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity to, to ask this question. This question is relevant and uncontroversial, so <laughs> no one is going to be caused in the chess space. <laughs> uh, we, we have been recently been dawned with, a, with the most horrific and grave error in our country and the world at large. Um, courts have become, at that time, were less functionary cases at standstill. We witnessed courts of law, particularly the high court, um, resorting to more virtual trials and adjudications. It shows that we are um, we are more we are moving forward in the fourth industrial revolution. Perhaps we are already in the fourth industrial revolution. So my question my first question is what is the department, uh, particularly my question is directed at the Honorable Deputy Minister John Jeffrey. What is the department doing? What is the status quo at this moment in time to make sure that the department, particularly the courts and um, all the courts, to industrialize them to be at par with the, with the, with, with the, the fourth industrial revolution? Is there anything that is, has been done? I, I can hear on the news that there is um, introduction of forensic audits by certain law firms, medium and the big five law firms. There is case law management. What is being done to the legal practitioners to make sure that they are incapacitated with the knowledge to deal with such technology? Is the curriculum that is taught this year and the following year a suitable curriculum to make sure that legal practitioners, when they go out there, they are in par with the fourth industrial revolution. This question is important. Perhaps I'm not actually expressing it well because it leads up to my next question. That is, what is being done also by the department to make sure that the fourth, in the, the fourth industrial revolution, the technology that it entails, it is able to meet up with the ability of a normal citizen to be able to understand what justice is. I'm not sure if I'm understood well, but to be, yes. So, because a normal citizen who's perhaps illiterate. You mean what are we doing to empower the citizens about justice? Yes. And where are we going? Yes, yes. Because I don't know if it's me who will be exaggerating this point or it is the media. There has been vast injustice in our society, and there's a need for the department to take action. There's a specific need for the department to account what has been happening in our country, and no one is taking, no one is held to account. Terrorism, corruption, mass murder cases, social unrest, specifically the, the, the last year, July unrest, GPV, the list goes on. So. If we do have justice, as we say today that we do have justice, I'm not sure if that's the case, but if we are saying that people should access justice, people should be able to access justice um, in a way, if, if say for instance, a person is um, holding another person to account for delict or whatsoever, um, grievance they have against that other person, will the, will the person be able to go on Zoom and attend that case? Will the person be able to understand what case flow management is and so on? Anything that has to do with technology and the industrialization of the legal Got your question. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Number eight, was it the young lady there with the yellow jacket? Uh, can we take the mic there, please? Greetings to everyone. Shh, colleagues. My question. Your name? Colleagues. Yes, number nine, Abega. Thank you. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, like you. <laughs> uh, good morning uh, to everyone, uh, also uh, to the panel. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, Abega Valen, good think afternoon. think he just walked into college, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, guys, and also to the panel. Well, I'll be just brief. Uh, Your I, won't name? Take, I won't take long. My name is Mangoba Mkunu. Uh, I'm, a journalist, I'm a journalist at Highway Radio uh, and I graduated at Devon University of Technology here in Devon. Right, so my, my question is just going to be brief, um, so it won't take long. So it's got to do with the unemployment rate. As we know that the unemployment rate uh, continues to increase every now and then. But the, the, the biggest question is that, uh, as you know, that uh, you get students that obviously that's going to graduate. Uh, pass very well like uh, distinctions but you get to a point where they start to look for employment they start to look for a job and turns out to, to be that they, 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 there's an experience required where there is a three three years of experience uh, four years of experience six years of experience but now the, the biggest question is that um, they've just finished uh, their, with their studies and already they, they're seeking for employment it turns out to be they have to to have that three three years of experience that, that's the question that what is the way of moving forward what is the strategy in, in solving in solving in solving that out as we know that the uh, unemployment rate continues to, to to increase so that acts as a barrier to the students in order to get employment yeah so Agreed. I just stop there. thank you thank you so thank much. you can we just stop there so we allow the deputy minister okay, uh, okay let's uh, okay, let's just allow everyone to answer and then um, uh, Deputy Minister, most of the questions were for you, but uh, CGE, CGE, would you like to answer Asanda's question and then we'll give the floor to Deputy Minister. Thank you, uh, Asanda, for the question. And I just also want to validate that your question is a very valid and important question. And um, not to fight anyone, but to say the fact that when you started asking that question, people started laughing. That's the problem. Yeah. And that is why we are faced with such challenges when it comes to people, especially men, coming forward and acknowledging and saying, I have a, a, a problem. It is exactly that point before it all is very smart. Imagine we're laughing, Asanda speaking on behalf. So we need to be very careful and be serious when we have opportunities of this nature. Um, your, in most cases of GPV, one of the fact, factors that has been found, which you are correct to point, to point out, is the issue of the frustration 
that men have found themselves in because of many reasons. One reason is the fact that uh, a lot of men have lost their jobs because of the issue of uh, gender equality and many companies are employing more uh, women. But also the fact that gender equality is a challenge to men because it challenges what they believe was their birthright, um, this issue of being superior. So right now, you asked the question about how do we make it to be on par in terms of the training to be on par with what is needed out there. There has been a challenge that we have left men behind, and you are right. The Commission for Gender Equality, we have specific programs that are targeting men. To all those programs, they look at issues of um, how do we make sure that men understands that gender equality is for everyone, not only for men to um, reverse discrimination because that what other people are looking at it, especially men, they feel it's a reverse discrimination. I remember some years back in Guazulu Natal, there was a formation of an NGO which was called Isibaya Sama Daughter. That is by Asama daughter, Deputy Minister, marched to the CGE offices here in uh, Commercial City, wanting us to account Oguti why Sitata Abafaz is back Makanda Abu. Because they felt that with gender equality, um, we are saying women are superior than men, whereas we, we, we want to say we are equal and we want to exercise equal rights as provided in the Constitution. To answer your question, Asande, the Commission for Gender Equality have specific programs that uh, it, 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 uh, through our PAI public education and information where we look at issues of why men are angry. We participated in a national summit that was coordinated by Department of Social Development with the title, Why Men Are Angry. And with that summit, there was a lot of findings and recommendations that really did point to why men are angry. I heard Mangoba, you're coming from DUT. DUT have specific programs that, as the Commission for Gender Equality, we participate, that looks at issues of um, how to address this violence that is coming through the behaviors of men through peace, peace building uh, programs. So yes, Commission for Gender Equality, we have program for men, and we can speak about that uh, later. Thank you. Yes, uh, student, I just, I, I just want to address one question you raised just now. There is a problem with, um, I think it's lack of communication. You know, people who have, you know, um, facilities or resources to help you are actually keeping that information to themselves. And somebody t spoke of Saseta. I know if I ask you what do I mean Sasita by a Sasita, you won't know. And that's a shame. Sasita is an organization that cannot train anybody. But it has a lot of money. I don't know where, where, where they got it from, but they've got a lot of money. They've got they've got they've got a lot of money that they want to give it to give to you, but because you don't know, you will keep on complaining and saying, I, we, I, I'm going to get 3.5. If you get, if you go to a, an attorney, as a country attorney, you tell him that I want you to vouch for me to say if I make an application to Sasita, you will say you are going to give me articles. Your problem is solved. From uh, from uh, uh, students from coastal college who are doing um, um, was the, was dietitian or, or chefs who are studying as chefs, you can also go to Sasita as well and get the form, fill the forms there, and go to any hotel and tell them that Sasita has got the money, please train me. All, they, all you need from them is their signature. The same thing applies with the lawyers. All you need is their signature. The only thing, you must Google Sasita, go to them, talk to them. I've got a name there, but I, 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 will, not, I will not give it to you because I asked the guy to come here and address you. I don't know, I don't know whether there's anybody from Sasita today. I don't think so, but I've invited them. They haven't come, but that's your route to alleviate some of your problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. I think that's very helpful. DM, can I give the floor to you? You've got all the questions. Uh, thanks very much for the questions. I'm sorry we didn't have uh, more time. Maybe just to the University of Zululand people. Um, who complaining that you had to come here 
to listen to me. I haven't, I've been Deputy Minister for some time. I've never been invited to University of Zululand. So I'll just leave that. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not looking at, but I'm just saying I've spoken at, at, at Howard College, I've spoken at Peter Maritzburg, I haven't spoken at, at, uh, at UZ, although I have, I have been there a few times. Um, maybe just working backwards, um, firstly on the issues that, well, uh, it, uh, that Asanda raised on, on mental health issues and particularly just to re-emphasize the issue of GBV. Our legislation doesn't refer to men or women, the Domestic Violence Act. So a man can bring a case against uh, a woman uh, or same-sex partner or whatever, but a man can bring a case against a woman. The men will complain that they're not actually, that often they go and report it and if they go to the police station, the police will laugh at them because how can this man be beaten up by, by a woman? I mean, that's wrong. Um, but the reality is that the vast majority of cases of gender-based violence, women are the victims with men being the perpetrators. And I think let's also just be, be honest about it. South Africa is, has the worst gender-based violence in Africa. It has the worst gender-based violence in the Sadak region. So there's definitely something about us uh, which nobody, none of the sociologists have been able to, to come. Maybe it's you know, what apartheid did to breaking up families and, and, and things like that, but we do have a serious problem in South Africa. I do think a lot of it is a problem of men not being able to speak. So they bottle up their anger and then they lash out and badly injure or kill. And sometimes with some of the, 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 uh, the killings, well, the, the, the guy could not have been rational. Kills his wife, kills in front of the kids, then kills himself. What about those kids? No parents. But anyway, so I just wanted to re-emphasize that. Then to Mangoba, um, you raise the issue of unemployment, the, the problems of unemployment and the demand for experience. Look, a lot of... Um, there are a lot of internships, both from government and from the private sector, which, and the whole aim of those internships, uh, they don't pay that much, most of them, but that was to try and get people experience, to try and bridge the gap of somebody's come straight from, uh, from school, uh, from university or, or wherever, and they need practical experience. Um, those, that information is out there. Uh, I know with the lawyers that, I mean, I'm on a couple of uh, um, Twitter, ha I follow a couple of people who are specifically advertising posts for lawyers or candidate attorneys. So I think that would help, that would be there elsewhere. The government departments do offer internships. It is put on the website. Uh, it's generally known, maybe it's not known enough. But um, that's how, and, and there were a couple of other questions, I think Quanele also raised that, that point, uh, that, that um, of what's being done to try and address the problems of experience. Um, and Norba, though, just to issue specifically to you and, and Highway Radio, the Government Communication Information Service had a program, I think it stops now, uh, called Let's Talk Justice. And it would link up with community radio stations. It would pay those radio stations as a way of subsidizing them. And then there would be a topic on uh, some justice issue that people are interested in, maintenance, divorce, etc. It, it, until that happens again, I, I think if you want somebody from the Department of Justice to come and speak on a particular topic and take questions, if you've got that facility, then we'll, we'll do that, we'll organize it. Um, then to, to Voyo, um, look, COVID-19 did push us into the, um, in, into the well, fourth industrial revolution. We did keep the courts open but the courts had to go virtual. And um, there was a provision in the Criminal Procedure Act before that evidence could be heard virtually. We've put in a similar provision uh, to, um, in, in civil law as well in this recent um, Criminal Laws Amendment Act, which is coming into effect. Um, but, uh, so it is very much the future. I mean, why do you have to have a foreign language interpreter in court? If, 
why can't that foreign language interpreter be on the other end of a phone and listen to what's being said and then just translate it? Uh, Home Affairs are already doing that, I think, with some uh, foreign nationals. So uh, those, are, those are some of the things. We do have a infrastructure problem, um, which the department, unfortunately, still has a long way to go on in terms of, of ensuring that the facilities are there. Um, many courts around the country, uh, particularly in Limpopo, uh, don't have, um, uh, don't have, have uh, internet connectivity. Uh, so uh, those are issues that need to be addressed. But yes, it's, it's, a big, it's a big priority. It is the, uh, the, the, the future. Uh, Sunday Siwa, um, yes, I've seen that um, Cape Town um, uh, professional assistance candidate attorneys, sorry, yeah, candidate attorneys uh, letter. Um, it's something, it was addressed to the Western Cape LPC. I'm not sure if other provinces have come up with, with the same issue. For me, I do think that the, um, the payment, the salaries, um, is more complicated because it is linked to the more you pay someone, the fewer people you're going to be able to take. But as far as the general treatment of candidate attorneys, uh, that is something I think the Legal Practice Council nationally and provincially needs to look at. Um, there's almost a tradition in the legal fraternity. So you speak to many attorneys and they will tell you how badly they were treated when they were candidate attorneys. And then they don't learn and realize this is not what I should have been, what, what should have happened to me, why am I now doing it to somebody else? But they think it's part of the tradition. Uh, that, that I, um, you know, if you're a candidate attorney, you must be treated badly. I heard some story of, of some candidate attorney who had to drive uh, his principal's wife uh, to the nail clinic to get her nails done. Now, that's not what, you know, um, you know so those kinds of practices need to, need to stop. But, Sandesi, where you also spoke about, um, I think it was you that, that, that no, it was, it was, uh, Ms. Mjadu, I think I've got your name right, the issue of promises and the media and we're making promises. I'm not making any promises, okay? I'm, what my promise is, I will try and help. I cannot give you PLT at UZ uh, because it's done by uh, the, the Law Society of South Africa. But I will stay in contact uh, with Advocate Savoni uh, and the other role players that are here to address, to try and get your problem addressed. Is it a problem of not enough people wanting to do it because they're talking about 25, or is it something else? But I, I'm not promising you PLT, I can't deliver that. But what I will promise you is, is that I will give it my full attention and try and address it. Um, then, um, uh, then just to, to Kwanele, uh, look, I, I hear your your frustration uh, and um, it's difficult to respond. I, I'm not a person who gives false promises. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm very concerned about the number of law graduates who can't get articles or pupillage and finish their, their training. Um, I think you raised the issue of experience. I've addressed that uh, a little bit. But let's see what, let's continue the, the engagement to see what can be, what can be done. Then on Pinda, I don't know if, are you still there at the back? Yep. Um, look, I agree with you fully uh, in that there can't be social cohesion whilst you've got uh, these economic inequalities. We can't expect good race relations, equality between people, if the face of wealth, or it's as Thabo Mbeki said, uh, South Africa is a country of two nations, one rich and largely white, one black and poor. And that, we can't have that. So that is our crisis, I think, as, as South Africa. I, I don't necessarily want to get into a big debate with you on, on the political issues that you raised. But as I said earlier, I would like you to, there's a lot of different versions. Um, We've had corruption in our country uh, forever. I mean, the apartheid government was corrupt. But 
More recently, corruption became more endemic. It wasn't helped by the fact that we disbanded the Scorpions. That was a mistake. They were a good law enforcement agency. Uh, it wasn't helped by the fact that a number of state institutions and boards got hollowed out. That made it easier uh, for, for corruption to take place. You have a board of a company or something of an enterprise that is willing to give work to or tenders to particular people, and that's how it, how it goes. I think corruption is something we've got to face, look in the face, all of us as South Africans. Because we can't, we're going to fail as a nation if we don't combat it. And that corruption is also, when you get stopped on the road, if you're in a car, driving a car by the police, and they want cool drink, and you've been drinking, and they want cool drink not to report you. You can't offer it. You can't do it. You can't expect to uh, be able to jump the queue at home affairs if you pay a security guard. So those are, those are things we've, we've got to address. I would just say that, that as far as the former public protector's uh, remedial action, um, she, uh, her recommendation or remedial action was that, uh, that she couldn't finish the work because she was leaving office. It was interstate capture. Uh, she said that the president must appoint, because only the president can appoint, somebody nominated by the Chief Justice. And her fear was because the former president was implicated in some of these activities, as you would have seen from what's come out of the Zondo report, he, um, he shouldn't do it himself. Um, you may remember that the former president um, took the case on review, took that remedial action on review, he lost the case, he then decided not to, to appeal uh, further. So he accepted. And remember, he set up, and this, those, those memes are there, he, set, he appointed Zondo. He told us all that Judge Zondo is, is somebody who must be supported. So I, I think my issue is, is, I mean, then as far as the current president's issues with Pala Pala, um, look, it's, it's frustrating. We don't have all the facts of it. I don't have all the facts. Um, uh, if there's any wrongdoing, it needs to be investigated and there need to be prosecutions. The suspension of the public protector, that suspension had started long before Palapala. Um, the president had given her, asked her for reasons early in the year why she shouldn't be suspended. She had then gone to court to challenge him. Uh, they then agreed that uh, the thing would not, the, the, the inquiry would not continue or the suspension would not continue until that court case was held. Uh, she, tried, she tried to get the constitutional court to rescind its judgment. It refused. She tried to get them to rescind that rescission. Um, so uh, it, it's, not, it's not linked to, to Pala Pala. That was happening uh, before uh, and had, yeah, had been long in the making. And um, yeah, but, but basically, um, I've unfortunately got to attend another meeting here, um, but to thank you for your participation. I would like further engagements. I don't know how useful you find me. I'm an older a white man. I'm not, not yet 60, so I, I think it was Pinda talking, uh, but I do want to. I'm not doing another term, uh, so yes, you guys must take over. But anyway, it's, it's been very good, and I'd, I'd welcome further engagement. Thank you. Did we just get a resignation from the Deputy Minister? Oh, no, that's bad. Okay, we're going to end the session. Uh, there's our colleague from the BLA. Uh, Ma'am, you wanted to ask a question. No, sorry, no more questions. Deputy Minister has another meeting. Shh, colleagues. Uh, come here. We don't, I don't, I think they've gone with the roving mic. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Asia. I just wanted to raise two things to the students. Um, I am the, I'm the chairperson of the Black Lives Association. And what, especially the law students that are complaining about, we are aware of and we've been trying to ensure that we try and assist in ensuring that uh, people also do get spaces where maybe 
at times, I think we've raised the uh, Deputy Minister with the Master as well, to say that we can get the list that we can forward to the departments where uh, for students can actually go and uh, do their work work while they're still at varsity. And secondly, you know, even just to volunteer your time, because we do know that there's a problem with the backlog at the master's office. There's even the filing, because when you are there, you do get to understand what the profession is all about. But then taking it back to you now, the problem sometimes that happens, why some of you do not get employed, I, I'm now talking as a director of the firm, is that we look, because we are inundated with CVs almost on a daily basis. You get a, a person that you want to give a chance to, the person drops up, and it's especially with the Gen Zs, um, where you, you rock up to an interview. You remember that you're going to be a, an, an attorney. And you, you know, and, and when you are an attorney, the first few seconds uh, actually determine whether a person trusts you or not. When they come into the office, it's how you are present, whether you are presentable or not. Someone rocks up, some even not, even in proper, you know, like shoes or in gents with a tie. And immediately, so these are some of the minor things that you must always consider as well when you are going to these interviews and uh, it, to say that look the part uh, of the job that you are applying for because there are so many of you that are applying. And just to give also just a sense of hope to the youth that you are not a step kid. I was trained, I did my BPROC in University of Zululand and uh, I have gone through a lot of things, I mean, a lot in, in, the, in the profession and I advanced. So it's possible and you can still do it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's good advice. On that note, colleagues, just let us take a few minutes. We just have a little token of appreciation for our, get, our panel members. Uh, Deputy Minister, before we close, if you can please just hand it over to them. And then Mr. Chairman will come and do a quick vote of thanks for our students. They each get getting a framed preamble to the Constitution. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I allow you to, oh dear, they want to photo with you on that side, please. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I give you the floor to just thank everyone? Thank you. No, thank you, Program Director. Uh, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Chairman is our Deputy Chairperson of the South African Youth Council. Thank you. Uh, that's the disadvantage of, of being the last to speak. Uh, many things have been forgotten. No, thank you, uh, Deputy Minister, stakeholders, uh, students, uh, receive our revolutionary greeting from us as South African Youth Council. Well, uh, to the event organizers, although we may feel that we are plotted because we must come and do the closing now, it's very difficult for us to even, we would have brought our speech also <laughs> to come and uh, address the ledge. But thank you nevertheless. Uh, well, uh, Deputy Minister, we welcome the initiative uh, in Wazul Natal on behalf of young people, uh, but also want to lobby you because you've had some of the engagement which were very critical. 
uh, that next time we are holding such uh, lectures, we must take it out of hotels. First, it must go to University of Unizu, so that uh, we have a more inclusive lecture to also, because these topics and these kind of themes do not only belong to people who are doing law, but they must also go to the public and the civilians. So that you are able, because they are very critical institutions, the chapter nine institution that are doing services to the public. So next time, must go to a community hall, but we'll start in Unizul first. Uh, well, also is about to close. I think on behalf of young people uh, in Wazul Natal, this month in the world symbolizes the celebration of Mandela month. It is true, we've seen on overseas uh, people from other countries really love South Africa. Right? They, they love it. And the uh, constitution, although we had to start putting and squabble our engagement, that our constitution is progressive, but in this part, we are not here in South Africa. Uh, but uh, we want to also say, in South Africa, South Africa is the most unequal society. It is true. Sometimes justice uh, in South Africa cost money. Now, we must remember that all of, not all of us can afford. Part of the things that we are raising, as we are saying, this month symbolizes uh, the celebration of Nelson Mandela and other countries. But here in Deppen, people of Deppen, last year they experienced a very, very, very distorting uh, uh, incident during the July unrest. Whereas in Phoenix, uh, people, their human rights were taken away. They could not walk on the street because they were perceived as criminals and they were ambushed. Now, DM, to your department, we are still calling for a commission of inquiry in the Phoenix atrocities. We are calling for it because we believe. I'm standing here and speaking on behalf of a, 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 a young local star from Guamamba whom his career was put uh, to on hold permanently by the vigilant who took away his right to walk on the street that day, just to walk on the street. He now, today, have one leg. Uh, his career has been put on hold. We're talking about on behalf of students of TUT. We know a TUT a student was murdered by a security guard. Today, there's no justice up until today. That is why we're saying justice sometimes was an equal society cost man. So with those words, we wanted to thank all of you who came here. We hope that next time you're going to recruit more people, not only people who are in the law society and the law department, to come and participate so that you are able to relay this information even to those people who cannot attend this such program. I thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that note, we close the program for today. And please, whoever's traveling,